Hello there developers. We're getting to one of the topics that I find are the most fun to work with, the Twinket automation interface. When working in a large project, you usually come to a point where some processes need to be automated in order to save time and increase quality of the deliverable. When working with the development of Twinket software, there are usually several steps involved to even create the most basic project and deploy it onto a target device. These steps are, for example, defining the real-time properties, writing unit tests, which we will get to in the next episode, creation of POUs and business logic and just simply writing the software, defining the inputs and outputs and linking them to the instances of the POUs, installing and referencing libraries, both Twinket system and own. Configuring the target and installing any necessary software, such as setting the IP addresses, installing the OPC UA server, etc. Creating an AMS route to the target. Selecting the target for deployment of the software. Activating configuration on the target. Now imagine, for example, that you work in a large project with multiple PLCs and that you want to automate these tasks so you don't have to do them manually for every PLC. This is where the Twinket automation comes into help. It helps you to automate the automation by enabling creation and manipulation of Twinket XAE configurations via programming or scripting code. I've used the Twinket automation interface in numerous projects and one of them is still to this day the most fun project I've ever worked in. It was in ESO's extremely large telescope, which once finished will be the world's largest optical telescope. In this project, we had a system that consisted of 132 Beckhoff PLCs, all running Twinket 3. Each of these 132 PLCs was responsible for the power distribution and monitoring for the control electronics for a set of mirror segments in the large primary mirror of the telescope. The automation interface was used for two different purposes in the system. One of them was during manufacturing of all the 132 electrical cabinets that contained the PLCs. Thanks to the automation interface, we could write a piece of software that automatically configured and tested all electrical cabinets, saving the project time and money and at the same time increasing quality. For the future, ESO will also be able to update the software for all 132 PLCs with a simple ex execution of a command. It would simply be extremely time consuming to do this manually for all the PLCs and could even impact the available time for doing astronomy and science with the telescope. By using the automation interface, all PLCs can be updated more or less at the same time. This project was a lot of fun indeed. I have written about this project in the context of the Twinket automation interface and I have included links to this in the video description below. Even though this was undoubtedly the coolest and most uh, fun project where I've used the automation interface, there are numerous other instances where the automation interface have been useful and most likely will be useful for you as well. Enough for an introduction talk. Let's dive into some theory. Let us first look at the different things that we usually do in the Twinket XAE, that is the integrated development environment for Twinket software. A few of the things that you normally do in the Twinket XAE and for which we've already done a few in this tutorial are for example, build and clean a project, activate the configuration, create AMS routes, do a broadcast search, Configure real-time settings of a project. Add and remove tasks. Adding and removing of inputs and outputs. Running the static code analyzer. Selecting the target device. Management of POUs. Management of libraries. With the Twinket automation interface, it's possible to automate most of the things you do manually in Twinket. It provides bindings for various programming languages so that you can automate the automation in different languages. There are bindings both for programming languages such as C++ and C Sharp, but also for scripting languages such as PowerShell and IronPython. 
In this way, you can use your favorite programming or scripting language to automate your tasks. Through the automation interface, we are not limited to this list. You can do almost everything that you would manually do in Twinkit. To fully automate the different tasks in Twinkit, we need two components. The Visual Studio DTE, short for Development Tools Environment, and the Twinkit Automation Interface. The DTE is a Microsoft software product and makes it possible to programmatically access the functionality of Visual Studio, such as Find and Replace, the Error List, Management of Builds, and accessing the Status Bar. As the TCXA shell is based on Visual Studio, this also applies to the TCXA shell. On the right we have the Twinkit Automation Interface. Through the Automation Interface we get access to everything that Peckoff have added on top of Visual Studio. This includes the Twinkit specific stuff such as PLC project handling, linking of variables, management of the inputs and outputs and much more. By utilizing these two together, we can fully programmatically automate various tasks for our automation software. Now you've got enough theory, it's time for some practice. Hello everyone, it's time for a little bit of programming. And in this part we're gonna use the Twinkat automation interface, obviously, and we're gonna create a quite simple program to showcase the automation interface. In this program we're gonna do two things we are going to do an activate configuration. So to activate the software that we're running here, in this example, it's just a very simple program. We will activate it on a target device. But before doing the activate configuration, we will also select the target in, uh, so the target for the, for the configuration. And um, in here we have local, which we've been running so far, so the, our own virtual machine. But we will also be able to, to change it, so we can change it to something else. And in this case I have a PLC connected here, so I have created an AMS route to the PLC, so that we, from the automation interface software that we're gonna write, we can just choose which one of these two that we're gonna activate the configuration on. To do this, we're gonna do more or less the same thing as we did in the last episode about ideas. We're gonna create a C-sharp program in, in, in .NET. And the reason I choose C-sharp again is the exact same reason as the last time. It's because there's just much more documentation using C-sharp than any other language. You can use other languages, you can use C++, you can use scripting languages such as PowerShell to use the automation interface, though in here I'm gonna use C-sharp. As in the last episode, we start Visual Studio 2022. We create a new project and we, it's a console application. We call it Twinkat uh, for just TC Automation. Let's just call it TC Automation. Next, a .NET 6 project. Uh, select this guy. So again, even though .NET 6 is cross-platform, you can run it on Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. We're only going to run this on Windows because the automation interface per definition will only be running in Windows because the whole development environment is on Windows. So again, the automation interface is just as a way to programmatically access your XAE. And the XAE per definition always runs on Windows. So, I mean, it's nice that we can run this on different platforms, but it's only gonna work on Windows in practice. So create, and we will get the usual hello world program. So we can just compile that and see that it works. And we can just execute it. So we go to that location and tcautomation.exe, we got the hello world. The first thing is that we will have to add a reference to the automation interface and to the DTE, right? So we had the two parts. We had the DTE, which is the part that concerns everything about Visual Studio, so that you can access the Visual Studio, the pure Visual Studio functions, which the XAE is based on. And then we have the automation interface, which is all the stuff that Beckhoff have added on top of Visual Studio, so the pure XAE stuff. Uh, and we do that through the dependencies. And here we 
add a com reference. So the automation interface is using something called com in, in background. It's not very important for you to understand how it is, but it's just to understand that that's what it's using. Add a com reference, and then you go down here, and here you have the automation interface stuff. And usually, if you create a new project, just always select the latest version of, of these interfaces. So what Beckoff do is that they add more and more stuff on top of the automation interface all the time. So you know, if, if there's a new version of the XAE, there's obviously going to be a new automation interface. Uh, there's going to be more stuff added to the automation interface to use the new functionality in the XAE. So we select OK, and then we're going to have to add some references. Uh, we're going to have to add the DTE. For this, we can just use standard NuGet packages. Simply add a NuGet package, browse, search for DTE. And uh, let's see here. This is not it. It should be NVDTE. So this one, and just choose the top, the two topmost ones. So NVDTE and NVDTE 80. I'm not sure we need this one, but this one we need for sure. Just choose these two guys, install, accept, install, accept. I think we're only gonna need this one. I, I think so. And then the next thing is that we want to be able, we need to provide the user of the, uh, this application a way to say which Visual Studio solution it should load, right? Because this program is the automation interface, but it needs to know which XAE project should I load. We need to provide this. But it was that wasn't the only thing, because another input that the program needs to know once it executes is which target device should we execute this one on, right? So we need to provide also the AMS net ID of where we should where we should do the activate configuration. And otherwise, if you, because if we didn't provide that, then we would just always do an activate configuration on, on the local host, which of course is interesting to do, but not very exciting. And for this, we need to add some form of parsing of the com command line. So we simply provide some parameters to the command line so that we can add this. And I like to use an open source parser called option set. It's here. It's, um, it's an open source one from, from yeah, that's available on, on GitHub. And I like this one for C sharp. This is similar for other languages. And, I, and there's of course many other for, for C sharp, but I like this one in particular because this is the one I've been using the last couple of years. So we simply search for, we need a dependency to that as well. And that's luckily just a NuGet package. Because again, if we go to nuget.org, we select Ndesk options, yeah, options. This is the guy we want. So we simply add that here. and install. Okay, so we can get rid of this hello world. And first, let's just create two strings. So one is for the, the path of the Visual Studio solution that we want to, to provide. Visual Studio file path, um, and then one for the AMS net ID. So these are the two parameters that we're gonna provide. So. Just set them to the empty string, and then we're gonna we're gonna go to the documentation for Endesk, and here we have some examples of how we use this one. So it's basically just copy paste this, or actually even better, we have the documentation here. I'm gonna provide the links in the video description so you can check. But you basically create an object option set and you add uh, the parameters that you want and a little description, possibly. Uh, so we're gonna copy, let's see which one are we gonna copy. We're gonna copy this guy. And you see, ah, Visual Studio automatically added the end disk options. And so again, that's the package we added here. And we want, oh, let's rename this P doesn't say so much. So let's select options. Uh, Verbose we don't need, maybe we want a help. So we can just provide a message for the user when he uses that. Uh, so that seems to be a Boolean. So just to know whether we should print a help and exit the application. 
which is useful for most console applications. You know, when you when you start a console application, you want to see what you can provide a parameter help, and then you see what what stuff you can provide to this application. So let's just create a bool show help. Then let's put this guy here. Uh, and I guess, yeah, and here we want to provide the file for uh, the Visual Studio file path. Let's call it F uh, VS file path, for example. And that should be stored in R. See, this should be stored here. So equals V. And we want the same thing for the AMS net ID. So AMS net ID. And oops, let's just do like this. MS net ID. Okay. Then if you look at the example, it does some parsing here. So first we parse it. It does a try catch on the on P, so which are our options, and with the arguments, so with everything that go, goes inside the console application. Let's copy paste that. Copy pasting. That's that, that's what you can do when you work with with other languages than structured text. Then you can copy paste a lot. So we we don't need the output. We just want to parse it. Options, uh, and then we want to yeah catch the exception. And instead of uh, return, we can do environment exit one just to indicate. So we we exit the application and indicates that. Hey, we got a problem, and we will know what problem because we couldn't parse the, the input parameters. And then instead of yeah, we don't need this message either. That basically provides us these parameters. So we have a Visual Studio file path and AMS net ID. Next, we should check. Well, first we can, for example, just write a help command. For this, they also have if show help, then run show help, and show help just does this. So we can. We can copy that. Copying, copying. That's <laughs> yeah. If if my clients or the workplaces I worked on would just see how much I copy, then I would get fired. No, I wouldn't because it's actually part of the work. Why reinvent reinvent the wheel? The important thing about copying, by the way, is I mean I don't have any problems with that. The only thing is of course it's good if you understand what you're copying so you're not just copying like this uh, and have no idea what you're doing it's it's good to at least <laughs> understand the code it is fun to learn after all uh, show help we don't need to create a separate method i'm just gonna you know right now i'm just gonna do everything from the top all the way to the bottom no classes nothing this is of course not what i recommend in a production program then i would split this up in some different classes and methods just to get along here i'm just gonna go from the top all the way to the bottom so I'm not gonna use a method. Instead, I'm just gonna provide this console write line. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's just copy everything. You usage greet. Our program is not greet, but TC automation. That's the name of our program. So TC automation yeah, options. We can remove this. And then we need we want to use the end desk options to provide the, the options uh, for output. And this we can do by simply using this method, write option descriptions, but for our object options. And then return. But again, instead of return, we just do an environment exit. It's a cleaner way uh, with a return code. Because we're going to have to use other uh, return codes if, if our program fails, for example. Then it's nice to, to, to provide some different return co codes than zero. For example, if you would put this in... Um, a continuous integration, continu continuous delivery pipeline, then it's of course nice to provide this information to the pipeline that something has failed uh, with, with the build. Because we will do a build. Remember, when you do an activate configuration, what it actually is doing in the background is doing a build and then it's transferring the files to the PLC. Uh, next, we should just check these guys, you know, just check if the file path and AMS net ID is provided. Um, with file path, we should just go to Google. File path, yeah, exists. This is, oh, it's in, 
is in German because I'm in Germany right now. Uh, but okay, file exists. That sounds good. Uh, it's okay. My my other hook. Yeah, I mean I'm pretty sure this is what we need. Uh, so if so here we check if not file exists and then it's the visual studio file path so we check if the file path so if the file doesn't exist so this is the solution file then we don't want to continue right because then we can't open the the twinket solution file and then we simply do uh yeah we could maybe actually do a console right line I feel so lazy when I copy paste. <laughs> the Twinket Visual Studio Solution does not exist. Right. And then again, environment exit one. So here we just, it's, it's a simple check. I mean, if we provide some garbage or some path that doesn't exist, then the program will exit. Next, we want to check if the user has provided an an AMS net ID and here we can just say that if the user hasn't provided an AMS net ID then we will run this on the localhost right so it, simply we will be running if, if the user doesn't provide anything we'll be running it on our virtual machine so that's a simple thing we can do here we can simply check if a string is empty and how do you do this with C sharp check if string empty C sharp uh, do, do, do. String is no longer okay. That sounds good. If string is empty, which is and now we check the AMS net ID. So we will it simply checks if it's null, which it won't be because we'll already initialize it to the empty string. But it also checks if it's empty, which it is. So if the user doesn't provide any string, then it will just be empty. If this, then we set it to the local, to the local AMS net ID, right? So let's just, I, I like this new thing in Visual Studio 2022 that it suggests, it automatically just suggests what you want to do. I don't know, it's, it's probably using lots of data from the web to, to do this, or maybe it's just reading my mind. I don't know, you know, computers nowadays, they're psh, super fancy. Uh, no, what was I doing? Yeah, so uh, no AMS net ID provided, assuming local AMS net ID, mm, something like this. And then we set the AMS net ID to, no. oh, look what I did. I, I used the structure text assignment. This is the problem, right? When you're working with several programming languages with different projects, then you just mess it up. <laughs> AMS net ID is the local one. So this is the local host AMS net ID, which is, uh, let's see here, 127.0, no, 001.1, like this. Is it correct? Wait. No. Uh, now I have to think in Swedish. 127.0.0.1.1.1. Yeah, that's right. And here we don't want exit, right? So we don't want to do an environment exit simply because if the user doesn't provide anything, we will use the local MS net ID. If the user provides something, then we will use that. I mean, a more elaborate thing would be, of course, to check to write a class that checks whether this is a correct AMS net ID. I'm not going to do that here now. You should do it. It's a good exercise. The next thing is that we will probably go to the web because we are very lucky with the web as the Twinket automation interface is very, very well documented, I would say. So at least better than the average. So we have everything prepared. We have an application that actually let's run the application first. Just run it with help to see that we got help. Uh, no, it failed. So something is not right. Ah, sorry. Okay, there. Yeah, so now we have a nice, uh, a little bit of documentation of how to use this application. So now we have an application that provides this file path and AMS net ID. And now we want to start to use the DTE and the automation interface. 
And for this, we're going to go to the Beckhoff website because there's basically examples for every use case. I would really recommend you to, to, to look at everything. There's many examples, of course, installation. We already went through that. I mean, again, the installation basically just mentions that the Twinket automation interface is automatically there if you have installed the XAE on your machine. So I actually forgot to mention that, but of course, for you to use the automation interface, it's required for you to have Twinket, the Twinket XAE installed on that machine because you're after all gonna use the Twinket XAE, right? And then you have many other, many other things, uh, configuration, blah, blah, blah. Actually, I prepared some, uh, uh, some bookmarks. You have the activate config. So if you go to base best practice system, then you have something called opening and activating existing configurations. So I thought this is what we need. We're just simply going to copy paste this thing and adjust it to our needs. So this isn't doing everything we need because we still need to do set the AMSNet ID, but it does the activate configuration, which we can start with and then we will adjust this to our needs. So I'm gonna copy this uh, here and uh, do, do, do. and again, for your information, I would really like recommend you to look at the other things here because there's just so much you can you can learn from here. And I mean, generally, just think of it like everything that you can do manually in almost everything that you can do manually in Twinket, you can do through the automation interface. And how to do it, you have to look into the documentation. And if you don't find it in the documentation, you can probably figure it out. It's not rocket science. Okay, so let's copy it. And what this does is that it copies. First, we, we want to create one um, instance of the DTE, right? So the DTE, again, was the thing to access Visual Studio. And that's what we have to do first, because without the DTE, we can't use the automation interface. And what Beckhoff are doing here is that they're saying that we want to use this particular version of Visual Studio, which we don't want. So if you go to, if you just Google Visual Studio versions, Mm, tip. Then you have lots of document information, but if you go down here, then you have the version number for each version of Visual Studio. And as you can see, there's many, many different versions. And the latest one is 2022, which is version 17. When you see this, when you watch this video, there might be a newer version. And then this Wikipedia website will hopefully be updated. But uh, Visual Studio is, uh, the Twinket XAE is based on Visual Studio 2017. So for this example, for this, in this example, I'm just going to use the TCXAE shell, which, which we've been using so far for this, for this tutorial. You can, of course, use any other uh, Visual Studio. The important thing is, of course, that Twinket has to, ha has to have been integrated into that version of Visual Studio. However, so you would just think that maybe I just have to put 15 here, right? Because that's version 15. You can't because then it's actually gonna try to find Visual Studio 2017 and not the TCXA shell. The TCXA shell uh, has something, if you go to VS versions, so there's another part here in the documentation ca called handling different Visual Studio versions. Then you have the Twinket XE shell and for that you use this string instead. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. to use the XE shell when we activate uh, the configuration of the program. Now we have an object with the DTE, that is great. So we kind of have a handle uh, to, to uh, an instance of Visual Studio. The next thing is suppress UI is equal to false and visible tru true. So what this says is that with these two lines of code, we will actually see Visual Studio in launching fully, you know, so it, it will be automated. You will see that everything will just happen automatically, but we will see the TCXA shell. And normally this, I would recommend this to, to suppress it and not show it because, you know, normally you, you, you want to, you, you don't care about seeing that. You just want to have an application that does everything automatically and you want to see it in the command line. But to just show the point um, the first time, I'm, I'm going to leave it like this so you will see that the TCXA shell is actually executed. Then we need a reference to the solution. So right, we have the DTE and then we need the solution. So the actual project that we're going to work with. So in our case, you know, we're going to work with, uh, with, with this. Pro uh, we have a project here that we're going to use the automation interface for. And you know that's a that's a solution file, and that's the solution that it refers to. So we need a handle to the solution through the through the DTE, and we're not gonna hard code it like they've done here. We're gonna instead use the one that is provided through the command line. So we're gonna open 
the solution that the user has provided through the command line. And for this, we already had, have it, right? Because that's our Visual Studio file path. So we're gonna open the Visual Studio file path. And once the Visual Studio file path is opened, then we need a reference to the project, right? So the way that a solution file works in the Microsoft Visual Studio world is that a solution can have one or more projects, or actually no projects at all, that, that doesn't make any sense, but you can have one or more projects. And in this case, we're only gonna have one project because we only care about the Twinket project that's gonna be there. You could put other projects there as well. You could put, put a C Sharp project there. You could put an HMI project in there. You could put many other things, but we only care about the first one. So if you would have more than one project, then you would of course obviously have to take care of it here. But in this case, uh, the solution file only has the Twinket project. So we uh, go to the solutions, look at the projects, and we take the first one. So far, we haven't been using the automation interface at all. So far, everything up here has been pure and clean Microsoft Visual Studio DT stuff. So no back off, not, no back off whatsoever so far. Now we're getting to the back off stuff because now we have a handle to the project and through this handle, we're gonna have to start to use the automation interface because this project is a Twinket project. So now we just have to say, okay, here, I'm holding you a Twinket project. That's the pro thing here. Now I wanna to start to use my the automation interface API on you. And for that, we're gonna use the ITSYS manager. And the ITSYS manager is like the God class for, for everything that you wanna do with the automation interface. It holds a lot of stuff for the Twinket automation interface. And you can always go to the API. And here you can just see that the ITSYS manager is, you know, is the main interface of the Twinket automation interface. And if you look at it, you can just see that there's just lots and lots of stuff you can do with it. There's many different methods that you can invoke. And one of them is, yeah, you can already see it here, activate configuration, start restart Twinket, which is also quite nice because you know, when you've activated the configuration, you wanna restart the runtime so that it loads the new software that you loaded there. One thing I should mention, however, is that the ITSYS manager is continuously updated by Beckhoff. So I know that the example we just copied, it refers to the ITSYS manager here, but there are newer versions. And the way that the ITSYS manager works is that every time Beckhoff add new functionality, they increment the number of the ITSYS manager to get a, yeah, it actually, wait, they're actually, it, they mention it here. Therefore, each time a new set of features was added, blah, 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 the ITSYS manager X, where X is a number which is incremented each time a new interface was added. So what I generally do when I create a new project that's gonna be used for newer versions of Twinket is that I simply check which one is the is the latest version of the ITSYS manager. And I know I recently used uh, 14 and maybe there's even a 15 now. Yeah, it seems so, 16 maybe, no. So, okay, ITSYS manager 15. So we're simply gonna have a handle to, the, to a newer version of, of this one. Then we seem to have, a, let's see if we can compile this. Okay, failed, so we have a, cannot implicitly convert a type. And did we have the problem without 15? No. Okay, so an explicit conversion exists. Are you missing a cast? Yes, we're missing a cast, but that's weird because we copied this example from, from the Beckhoff website and it doesn't work. So Beckhoff, psh, psh, you should fix this. Uh, we need to do a type conversion. So let's cast this. Like this and then um, built, now it works. And then when we have the, the handle to the uh, system manager, then we can invoke these methods like activate configuration, start restart Twinket. So these are the methods that's actually part of the automation interface. And I should note that there's of course many, many other things than the ITSYS manager here. So you have, uh, other classes to, to, to work with, with actual PLC projects individually, you know, and stuff so that you can go down into the IO tree. There's just lots of stuff here, but for this example, I'll just stick to the basics. Um, but that's pretty much it. So I would say that we are ready to run the project. And so one thing that we are missing now is the stuff with the AMS net ID. So we're not using this guy anywhere. So if we do this, what's gonna happen is that Twinket is gonna open this project. So we're gonna use this project, this dummy test, and it's gonna, just gonna activate it as it is, which means that it's gonna activate it on the local host that is in our virtual machine. So I will 
we need to find the where the project is. Uh, let's close it. Let's compile this guy again. And now let's run our, our TC automation. And it says we want to provide the VS file path. So F and then we provide the solution. So test uh, like this. Visual Studio solution does not exist. Okay. Ah, I accidentally added another T there. So you, you see, it worked. <laughs> um, so let's run it. Yeah, you see here in the background, now the TCXA shell is opening. No AMSNet ID provided, assuming local AMSNet ID. And it closed down. And let's check. And the application is running. See, that easy. It's fantastic. So we can actually just double check that it's indeed running by opening the dummy test and just logging in. Yeah, it's running. So that's that's quite neat. We can just double check doing uh, going back to config, making sure our application is our runtime is in config mode. Let's run the Let's run it one more time. See, it's opening in the background. So it's doing everything that you would do manually. It's just that it's done through the automation interface. Okay, and now, yeah, it's done. That's really cool. I would just put something like console uh, right line done at the bottom. So we know that it has actually exited the application. The next step is to use the um, AMSNet ID. And for this, we go to the documentation and we go, I found something called set target net ID. And here in the documentation for the ITSYS manager, so again, the one that we looked for at before, we have something called set target net ID. Set the target net ID of the currently open Twinkat configuration. So that's fantastic. So that's, this is the guy we need, and it just needs a string of the net ID, which we already have because that's part of the stuff that the user provides. So we need to add that. So when we have the, we need to add that before we do the activate configuration, right? Because normally, just, just think of the automation like the sequence of steps that you do manually, okay? So you don't do activate configuration and then you change the AMS net ID. You first change the AMS net ID and then you do an activate configuration. Just think of it this way and do it exactly the same way in the code. So, um, so we use sysman activate configure, no, not activate configuration, but um, what was it called again now? Set target net ID, set target net ID. And we want to set the AMSNet ID of uh, the string. And let's just try it again, though with our local AMSNet ID. So here we're gonna need, did, did I compile it? Yeah, I did, yep. Then we need to add the parameter A, which is the AMSNet ID, and we're gonna set it to 127.0.0.0.1.1.1. Ah, now we got a problem. We got a problem, we got an exception, a com exception. The message filter indicated, blah, 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 blah. This is a problem when you're using the, the COM interface in together with the Twinket automation interface. It's a common problem, and but there is a fix for this, and it's actually even documented on the Beckoff website. So if you look at this one, uh, the COM message filter, here it says, for the so we're still in the documentation for the automation interface. Uh, message filtering is a mechanism that allows blah, 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 and uh, it, it basically says that you can get certain exceptions if you don't implement a com message filter, which is exactly what we got. So this is just something I would generally always put in every application that you do using the Twinket automation interface. And they have even provided um, uh, some examples. So again, here we only copy paste everything and run with it. So it says that we need to create a class 
uh, called they call it message filter so let's call it message filter here as well so we create a new class add new item it's a class um, message filter .cs. then let's copy yeah let's copy everything this I have to admit, I've looked at the code, I don't understand everything, uh, so that's a bad thing, of course, when you copy code and you have no idea what it does, but that's usually how it is, right? When you, you have a problem and you find a solution and then, okay, it works. And then uh, we need, uh, let's see this one, oh, yeah, we need to copy this as well, put it in the, here, it's not. It's in the same namespace, and uh, this is weird. This seems to be a error in the code, right? This should be out. Is it really like this in the? Is it really like this in the code? Yeah, back off. You have to. You have to fix this back off. <laughs> it should be a space there. Okay. Hopefully, someone from back off watches this video, and then you can tell the department working with the documentation to fix this. Um, can we compile this? No, we can't because we have... Uh, it should be new here. Okay, another thing. Is this really wrong here as well? New. Back off, you have to fix this. You can't leave it like this because then you're gonna confuse all my viewers. And then... But luckily now all my viewers watch this so they can just do what I did. Now we have a successful compilation. So that's all you need to do to get around this. And now we can run it again. Just set this into configuration. Yep, yeah, done, it worked. Uh, yeah, this is a problem. What we're gonna do now, one thing we forgot to do is actually we don't want to see the Visual Studio window anymore. So what we can do now, I mean, I, I've, I, I proved the case that you, the Twinkle Automation Interface and the DT opens up the application and everything just like you would do normally, manually. But now we don't need to do that anymore. So we can just suppress the UI and we can turn the visibility to false and compile it. And now if we run it, we won't get any anything on our screen. It's just gonna do everything in the background. Done. I, I want to point out another thing here is that I've noticed that the Twinket automation interface is working better with some versions of Visual Studio than others. The TCXE shell has some problems I've noticed. Um, this might be fixed when you watch this video in newer versions of Twinket. My personal favorite as of right now is Visual Studio 2015. This is where I have the least problems. So. I generally use when I create my, my my applications, when I want to use the Twinket automation interface, I generally use Visual Studio 2015 for this because it has the least amount of problems. So the final thing we want to do now is to just show that we can run this application so that we can activate the configuration on something else than our local machine. And we're going to do that by activating the configuration on a PLC that I have here. So I have a PLC here that's uh, that's running and we're gonna activate this configuration on that PLC by providing the AMS net ID of that PLC Which we can do because if we go to our router here I have prepared a route to a CX PLC I have here which with this AMS net ID So you just need to give me five minutes and I'm going to wire up the PLC and come back here soon again All right now you should see my PLC and as you can see here, it's in configuration mode because the lamp is blue, the TC, it's not entirely clear that it says TC there, but the lamp is anyway blue, which indicates that it is in configuration mode. And we can also verify it by checking, logging in through remote desktop to the PLC. And here we can also see that the PLC is in configuration mode. And what we're gonna do now is that we're gonna run our application so that we activate this application to the PLC and put it in run mode, right? Because that's what we do. We activate configuration and we start restart Twinket. Uh, so let's do that. 
but instead of activating the application on our local host, we want to activate it on our AMSnet ID of the PLC, which is this guy. So we're just going to change that. So it's 5.4493.176.11. So it's probably going to take a little bit longer time than with the when we were running it locally because we have to transfer the PLC, the, the program itself to the PLC, which is done when we activate the configuration. So let's run and see what happens. So now it's probably transferring the files to the PLC and we should see that the Twinkled runtime is restarting. Yeah, it's done. And now we can see it's red and green. And also green here. So it worked. We can double check by opening the application and just logging into the PLC and see that we're executing it. So let's open our application. And yeah, the target is the PLC. Let's log in. And we can see that the application is running on the PLC. So it worked. That's it for this part. The automation interface lets you automate a lot of the different tasks that you manually do in the Twinkat XCE environment. And I hope this part gave you a tiny peek into how it's possible to do it. Remember to check out the documentation for the Twinkat automation interface at the Beckhoff website, as there are quite a few examples there that won't only give you some sample code, but also works as inspiration for what you can do with it. In the next episode, we will get into what I consider one of the most important topics of this series, test-driven development. I'd love to start talking a little bit about it now, but then we would ruin all the fun, so you will simply have to watch the next video. Hej då, vi ses!